Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to have you all here today for our virtual conference. Let me show you what we're going to do. I'll explain the format and then I'm going to turn it right over to the seniors. So instead of our normal poster program where we'd have a bunch of people around with their work that you could see visually, instead what each senior is going to do today is be able to show you what they've been working on by sharing their screen, walking you through their project, and showing you exactly what they've done. Um, we're going to do it in a way where you're going to have some time for presentation and then some time for, um, oops, sorry, and then some time for question and answer. And so each of the students is going to have the opportunity to call on people. If you haven't tried it out yet, you can try the raise hand function. So everyone else should be able to raise a hand if you have a question. And we're gonna keep it snappy. So each of our presenters, which you should be able to see here, Christine Peterson, Dylan Van Sickle, Monica Mosier, Abigail Miola, Olivia Shanahan, and Lila King, will present for about four minutes and then we'll have a little time for Q&A before we move on to the next. is going to be up first and Christine as a co-host you should be able to share your screen. I and think you're me, you're yep, there you go. Yeah. Okay, so let me know if you can't see it, but I think I think it should be up and working right now. Um, yeah. So hello. All right, perfect. Uh, so hello, everybody. My name is Christine. I am a biology and science communication major, and my project is examining the role of technology in college students' um, attention and learning. So my question going into this research was mainly what relationships exist between college students learning attention and their reported attitudes and perceptions around technology use. So the reason I chose this topic was because um, I was interested as a biology major in more of the science behind attention span and then being able to see if I could tie that into behaviors specifically around college students in the classroom. So I first started by researching attention span just to get an idea of um, how it's currently measured in other studies and how people actually define and quantify it as a variable. Then I looked at technology and the role it plays and how I could actually capture the attitudes and behaviors that students have towards using their devices, whether that's inside the classroom or just outside regular um, device behavior. Then I wanted to analyze how performance on an attention heavy task actually aligns with the reported attitudes and behaviors around technology. So kind of tying all three of these ideas in together. How I got started was I first designed a survey using the Cal subject pool in order to actually um, receive the self-reported uh, self attitudes from students about their own perceptions of learning and uh, technology use. And then at the end of that, I also used an attention-based task, which is called the color word Stroop test. And this is just used to capture a baseline measure of attention um, by responding to the ink color presented on the screen. So how it works is the respondents um, say whether or not the color presented is, uh, or you would say like, for example, under condition A, this is the easier or less attention heavy example called the congruent case. And as you can see here, it's where the color of the ink actually matches the word that's presented on the screen. So it's a lot easier than let's say condition B right here, which is the incongruent. And that's where um, the ink color is different than the word presented. So just to show you a quick demonstration, if you wanna try doing it in your head, just real quick, um, this is kind of what it looks like on the screen. The words are presented pretty quickly and you have to respond to the ink color shown. So as I mentioned, I used the Cal subject pool um, targeted to the first year students. And from my sample, I was able to get 160 student responses. Um, and so of that sample, um, much like the Stevens population, we found that the majority were white non-Hispanic male students. Uh, the gender breakdown specifically was 59.7% male and 40.3% female. And then the key variables that I was looking at, there were five of them, which I won't go into detail now just for the interest of time, but if anybody has questions, I'd be happy to answer those during the Q&A portion. And so what I found was that among these variables, there were five significant correlations between them. Four of them were positive relationships, but the fifth, um, which is shown here between the Stroop 
test or the Stroop score and then the device time per day variable, that showed a negative relationship. So the correlations are all shown in this table, table one right here. And then more specifically, that negative correlation that I mentioned is shown in figure one. So the biggest and most interesting findings from this project was mainly that the um, in-class tech use reported by students was positively associated with more tech use outside of the classroom as well. So it just kind of indicates that there are similar behaviors between when students report using their phones or laptops in class and also um, reporting to use their devices more frequently outside. And then I think what definitely interested me the most from this was the fact that as this um, as this figure shows right here in figure one, um, when the tech use is increased per day, students were actually performing better on the Stroop test, and that means that they had a lower score. And this is because the Stroop test is measured by a response time. So the lower your score is the, it actually means the better that you performed at those harder incongruent cases. Um, so what this led me to believe is that maybe using technology more outside the classroom makes you less likely to be impacted by distractions just based on how people um, responded to the Stroop test and also their self-reported behaviors. Um, so if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to open it up to you guys. Let me see if I can find the chat again. I have a question and, and my thing can't raise its hand because of a co-host status, but yeah, that's so fine. You can just were, shout it out. If you were making a, a classroom policy based on what you know, what sort of policy would you make for tech use? Um, so I think definitely based on the self-reported responses that we had, people who were using their technology who um, said maybe they had selected more frequently using um, they're like touching their phone, for example, the phone touch variable was how many minutes or how many times do you estimate touching your phone in a, in a 50 minute class. So the people who reported doing that more frequently also reported that they were more likely to be distracted in classroom. And that was measured by the zone out variable, which I had mentioned um, is one of the five key variables. Um, so there was a positive association between the more frequent use of technology in class and how often they zone out. So I think that you can definitely say that people are being distracted by those devices when they're in class. Great. And it looks like Bobby has a question in the chat. I'll read it to you. It says, yeah. process, what did you find most challenging? How did you decide on what attention span test to use? Um, yeah, so that was actually pretty hard trying to find something that I would actually have access to using as a, as a college student. There are a lot of different ways that people have measured attention, but a lot of it involves programming that I didn't have or just the timing that I didn't have to do this. Um, so I used the Stroop test because I was able to find a program online that actually offered a free demonstration. So I just had to put the link directly in the survey and it would take students to a free sample where they didn't have to download anything. Um, and it calculated the Stroop effect score for me. So it was just for ease of use, I guess. Okay, and then there's one final question um, from Lainey. It says, is phone use as a class, like collectively a different category? What if the students were instructed to use their phones for class work? What do you think you would find? Oh, that's an interesting question. I didn't ask it in a way that was like whether or not you use your phone for classroom work. Um, that was mostly just to see, you know, how in general, how often do people touch their phone in a class because I kind of indicated or I kind of assumed that that would indicate that they're distracted by their devices. Um, so it would be interesting to see what that would look like if you were to break it up more specifically. I just didn't want to overwhelm the respondents with a lot of different questions because it was kind of hard to narrow down which questions I thought were most important to actually measuring these variables since they are such a quantify, uh, well, yeah, so they're basically such a, um, sorry, what's the word? Um, because it's self-reported, it's kind of hard to actually measure those, if that makes any sense. Um, so that was definitely really difficult to kind of narrow down how I could actually capture those attitudes. And then also if students were being honest, maybe they don't realize how often they actually do look at their phone in class and things like that. Great work. So Christine Peterson, one of Kristen Carl's seniors this year. This is awesome. Thanks for presenting with us today. Thank you so Next much. Next up, yeah, is Dylan Van Sickle. So Dylan, whenever you're ready, you can share your screen. Great. How's it going, everybody? Okay. All righty. Uh, can everybody see my screen? 
Great. So good morning. My name is Dylan Van Sickle, as Professor Cormack introduced me, and I'll be discussing the product of my senior thesis research, which is the next mission, an analysis of the veteran suicide problem in the United States. So an average of 20 veterans have committed suicide every day for over a decade. And while this is a national issue, I began by looking towards the states and the data collected by the Veteran Affairs and the Census Bureau. So here I noticed a really important pattern and that was across all age groups and total records, um, certain states were consistently present amongst the lowest and highest states uh, veteran suicide rates. And these weren't just small differences, they were considerable differences. Um, so this led me to ask, what has caused such a disparity in state performance in handling the issue of veteran suicide? So not an excellent table uh, given the, the platform, but you can see that there uh, is um, some consistent trends on both sides of this um, issue. So I then analyzed a set of variables, which I determined were all contributors to the issue and could be compared at the state level. So the first set of positive variables all impacted veteran suicide rate at the state level in such a way that as they increased, the veteran suicide rates decreased. And then in the second set of negative variables, so to speak, these all impacted veteran suicide rate at the state level in such a way that as they increased, the vet suicide rate uh, increased as well. So all of these relationships prove statistically significant with a p-value of less than 0 0.05, except for the uh, veterans health, uh, mental health spending per veteran per state. So now a quick look at some of the graphical representations. Here's one for veteran owned businesses as compared to the state veteran suicide rate. So you can see a pretty consistent trend uh, negative, which is great. Via education and employment spending, we see the same kind of results. And then veteran median annual income, again, we see very similar results. So these are just a few of the graphical representations of the multiple that we did. Um, I thought it would be nice that you guys could see it that way rather than just a table format. So upon a further, more in-depth review of the state policy, specifically focused on the top three and the bottom three performers, um, like I, I mentioned earlier in that table, uh, and with the previously mentioned variables in mind, I noticed a major difference in the policy initiatives and implementations between these states, um, specifically related to education, employment, mental health services, and spending. Um, whether those states towards the bottom didn't actually have any resources listed online or were extremely difficult to find, or there was just a major discrepancy in how the states went about handling these variety of variables. Um, there was a clear indication that the difference in the suicide rates could be linked to how the states were implementing and executing their policy initiatives. So my recommendation is quite simple. Um, we have st seen states who have enjoyed relative success, and, and these states can be used as models to plan and execute effective policy measures. In sum, the states and veteran community are fully capable of remedying this issue. The veteran community is, is obviously in need, and, and I think it's, it's really the responsibility of the American public and public officials who we have, who we have elected um, to deliver veterans with their next mission and ensure the future success as a nation. And with that, I want to thank you all for your time. Thank you, Professor Cormack, for her work with me over the past year. What are your questions? So Dylan, I'm going to read you one of the questions from the chat. Um, it's from Bobby Pelfrey. It says, in terms of states that historically vote Republican versus Democratic, did you find any connections? Like, did blue states have more mental health services? Oregon looked like it was an outlier. Uh, right. So I tried to stay away from uh, the partisan issue more because um, there wasn't, in the preliminary research that I had done, it didn't prove that certain states leaned either way and then also trended the same for um, uh, the suicide rate. So while their argument could be made for a handful of states, uh, this varied like really greatly across the country as a whole. I saw Professor Carl raise your hand. Samantha has a question. Um, Professor Muka does. It's are veteran suicides broken down by branch in your analysis? Uh, I didn't break it down by branch. Uh, this only applied to active duty, however, though. So these are active duty veterans, um, but I incorporated all branches uh, Army, Navy, Coast Guard, Air Force, Marine Corps. Um, so everybody was accounted for. Yep.
And then Professor Mullen asks, did you find any patterns in typical age or specific wars that people fought in? Uh, yeah, so I'll go back to the uh, table. So these were specific age bins um, that we kind of broke them down into. And you can see that uh, the younger ages have higher rates. And unfortunately, that's because as you grow older, um, those who have uh, committed suicide can no longer commit the action later in life. So you see lower rates. However, um, it's pretty consistent across different um, groups from different conflicts. Um, the major difference is how it's been handled over time. So like I said, that this issue has been pervasive um, since the early 2000s. And that was obviously still fallout from the conflict in Vietnam and the Gulf Wars. Uh, and it's continued to persist since uh, you know, our entrance into Afghanistan and Iraq. All right, thank you, Dylan. This thank has you. been awesome working with you and I'm really proud of the stuff that you've been able to find. Monica Mosier, you are up next. Um, I believe you're the host already, so you should yeah. be able to share your screen. Perfect. Let me, I believe. All right. Can you see it? I can see you. Okay. Let me, okay. Yeah. There we go. Don't know why it's saying like open system preferences. I feel like I should have done this before, but this is this. Yeah, there we go. Wait, what did I just, hold on. Technical difficulties. Clearly, this clearly this is my first time doing this. I happens to the best of us. Hold on. What do? You, okay. There we go. And yeah, can you see this? No, I can still see your face. Oh my god. Oh, I didn't hit the share button, and now. Yeah, I didn't hit the share button. Now, there, you go. there we go. Yep. Yeah, all right. So I did, so my, pres, my thesis is titled Silence Brand, how brands, can how brands Can Modify What Gen Z Thinks Is Cool. I just finalized it this morning because I'm the worst at coming up with titles and pardon me if I ramble. So what I wanted to do with my research is find the connection between cool brands, Generation Z, and behavioral targeting, and how, this, and how these connections can modify the behavior and spending, like behavior and consumer habits of an entire generation. So basically what cool brands do is essentially using technology and social media to advertise, but doing so in a way that can personify community like corporations and appear relatable on social media, especially for a generation. Notable examples of how it started was when Denny's, the diner chain, used, created a Tumblr account that basically involved posts and content that used, that seemed very much more related to, that seemed a lot like what a common person would post on that platform. Another notable Use, another notable usage of social media to make a brand appear cool was when Oreo seized the opportunity during the 2013 Super Bowl blackout to create, a, to create a quick ad saying that power out, no problem, you can still dunk in the dark. And sometimes this might not have been, and sometimes there are brands that tried to do this, but it didn't really work. For example, the brand Sunny D, the, actually during the 2019 Super Bowl, posted a tweet in frustration about what was going on, especially considering that game was considered very boring, and simply tweeted, I can't do this anymore, which to many came off as it's usually what people associate when you see somebody who might be in trouble mentally. So this led to a lot of some resist. There's been resistance to this kind of trend, but a lot of it was because people have been growing tired of it as brands started to act more and more relatable. It would come off as a lot more pandering and just kind of not as genuine as people had expected, which spawned the meme silence brand where people would just share that image in the, like in comments to the, to any posts that brands would post on social media. And some, and some just unfortunately missed the mark, like that unfortunate Mr. Peanut campaign that happened at this year's Super Bowl that unfortunately coincided with Kobe Bryant's death and, and led to a new mascot that was very poorly named. And, but meanwhile, a lot of, brands have been successful in having this cool stuff, especially Wendy's, for, which became known for having their Twitter just roast a whole roast other fast food chains and other companies as well. 
And Netflix has also appeared to take on this relatable trend. And this is just a thread from Stakem. It's basically explaining why people find this to be so cool. Essentially, it's showing that like, you know, younger people are like feeling very isolated in this world and just try to just are trying to seek a sense of normalcy and relatability through a very chaotic time. This was made two years ago, but it speaks volumes, especially in the context of now. And because of that, now they've, ironically, they say they've had mass advertising drilled into their media consumption. And meanwhile, they are doing, they created this to explain that, but now they're also a massive corporation drilling into media consumption. So, but they summed it up pretty well. Now, behavioral targeting, in some ways it's different, but it also, but it involves a very similar thing. So essentially it's a structural feature in technology and it notably became the revenue model for Google starting in the 2000s. And it's led a lot of other companies to take on this revenue model, seeing how profitable it can be, where profiles are created about you by third party people, you seeing your data, seeing what you've been looking at and thus pushing products that are tailored towards you. And in many ways, this can, it's similar because it involves this, it involves similar levels of engagement that social media does because if you look at a, if you look at tweets and you engage with them, that is seen as a win. If you engage with an ad that's targeted at you, that's seen as a win. And in many ways, both have been successful in profiling the ways that, in profiling how other like, in profiling this generation, and in some ways even modifying their behavior. And profiling can involve finding things out about people. And especially with this, with the younger generation, there are many people, like many people are have, dealing with social media addiction. It means they're gonna be on their phone more often and more likely to engage with things. And, in, and especially, and with, sorry, and growing up with home technology, with home technologies such as Amazon Alexas and Nest and le like Nest thermostats, just having a much more digital forward house, it leads companies to be able to reach younger people earlier and earlier and have them be more familiar with what they do by the time that they get older and can later purchase those, those on their own. And another, hi and another highlight involved Pokemon Go, the app that, an app on your, like an app on your phone that involved, that involved catching Pokemon, but also in some ways still modifying your behavior by telling you to go to certain places to catch a rare catch a rare Pokemon and maybe checking, checking out businesses and other areas when you get there. But there's also been many weaknesses in, this, in these methods. And a lot of the time it's because attitude can play a huge role in the effectiveness of, of behavioral targeting. If there's poor perception of a certain company or, some, or what corporations do, it'll lead, to, it'll lead to less modified behavior because it's not because people know, what, know the context, they know what they're doing, doing, they know that they're clearly being reached. And many, and, in, and this is especially, and it was especially seen when Burger King released their real meals, which was supposed to be in response to Happy Meals to tie in with, the ment with Mental Health Awareness Month, but many saw it as them capitalizing off of an issue just so they could sell stuff, and it, didn't, and it ended up not look, making them look good. But people are also starting to catch the drift of feeling like they're being monitored. A lot of, it's more feelings of being pandered to. And it's led to memes about having an FBI agent in your camera, just, and it's like, in some ways, just being incredibly self-aware among, among a younger generation. So why does this all matter? Why did every word that I just, you know, spat out of my mouth, like, matter in this sense? Can algorithms and technology really power what people think or think is cool? In some ways, yes, because so many because so many daily tasks are taking place online, and this and Generation Z is set to become the largest generation of consumers. And especially since they are considered digital natives by most marketing specialists, they're going to be online, and most stuff is happening online. And a lot of and this generation really feels like they need to see relevance. They need to feel like they need to feel like the company is reach is reaching them. And this can and it can be really and like this can be really impactful. Like companies have such a huge say over like daily life and they can continue to make things seem cool to people, but only if it's done correctly. If they if people just don't feel like they're being pandered to, then it can work. 
So essentially what I'm doing differently is studying the, is studying the effectiveness on one specific generation and synthesizing my findings to show how these, how these two things, behavioral targeting and cool branding can go hand in hand and how they have an effect on Gen Z. Thanks, Thanks. Monica. Um, so when you wanna do your Q and A's, if you wanna pop into the chat, people have put some questions in there. Yes. Um, and we will go to our next presenter, which is Abby. And I think you are already up. Is that right, Abigail? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I'm all set. Um, all right. Okay. So hi, good morning, uh, afternoon. My name is Abigail Miola and my advisor is Dr. Muka and I'll be talking about um, climate art and how it can affect climate communication moving forward. This is going to be contributing to a growing body of literature about the best practices in communicating climate change to a general audience. Um, so experts agree about the reality of climate change and also agree that um, if we're going to do anything practical, individuals have to do their best um, to push for systemic change surrounding um, climate policy. And for this reason, they're kind of been scrambling about what the best way to really get people thinking about climate change more often and get them to think about their own effects on that. So they've been trying different methods. Like you probably have seen climate images around the things of polar bears on the glaciers and um, these have not really proven to be very effective. So the next step in that is looking at um, artist interpretations, climate art, which leads to my research question, which is um, printed on the screen, to what extent can viewing climate art affect an individual's relationship with their environment? And throughout my presentation, um, there will be some of the images I used for my project on the screen for you guys to look at. Um, so what I did for my project is I did a between subjects survey experiment um, where there were three different groups and they saw one of three different sets of images. Um, one of them was what I called climate art, one that was called nature art, and one that was a mixture of both. Um, so if you look on the screen, the one on the left is an example of one of the nature art and the one on the right is climate art. So you can see there's kind of a difference in um, the kind of ideas that these pieces of art are um, portraying. And what I did was I turned to the literature to inform what I put in each set of art. And um, I tried to pull from different media, different styles in order to make it similar to viewing a collection of art. Um, and then after viewing these pieces, the participants were asked to um, describe a number of things, both um, with written responses, more qualitative responses, and also pre-filled um, questions. And I was gauging their level of understanding about what they were looking at, how they felt after viewing it, and if they had any sort of intention of acting on their feelings in the future. Um, what I found, there's some quotes here, but uh, generally what I found is that there was a really strong positive association when thinking about nature. So um, even without being prompted, many people looking at the, these nature images said really positive emotions, um, peaceful, inspiring, happy, things like that. And the converse is also true that when looking at climate images, they felt a really strong negative association. So um, they were frightened or um, stressed, these things. And something that I found really interesting was in the third set where there was a mix of both, um, really people seemed to gauge that they should be feeling conflicting feelings. They said um, sets of two different emotions like haunting and beautiful in this quote. And the other thing that I found really interesting about this third set is uh, there was an introduction of another thing, which was people seem to understand um, the human effect in this third set the best. So they would say things like, um, it's really upsetting that humans are affecting nature or that, um, that, they, that humans are degrading these natural surroundings. Um, so I found that a really interesting thing. And the quantitative results also reflected that. Um, here I have two graphs, which Professor Carl helped me generate. Thank you, Professor Carl. Um, on the left, this is one of uh, 
a finding that I found really interesting that is talking about um, emotions felt based on partisanship for each of the three treatments. Um, so treatment one was the climate art. And you can see that the level of peace for all across all partisanships was relatively low, which makes sense. Um, treatment two was the nature set. So you can see that strong Democrats felt really peaceful when looking at this, whereas as you became more Republican, you were less likely to find peace. And what I found really interesting about this was treatment three, the mixed set, um, Democrats were more likely to feel less peace. So they viewed it more as if it was talking about climate change and strong Republicans viewed it more as if it was talking about nature. So they felt more peace. Um, and then on the right here is just reiterating what I was saying before about emotions. So um, positive emotions were always with nature and negative emotions were generally with um, climate change. And um, the last thing that I wanted to talk about was the um, importance of a clear narrative in art. So I didn't give um, people specific instructions about what they should say in their responses, but they were generally much more um, receptive and of the what the information was and how they should respond if um, they felt like they understood what the art was trying to tell them. Otherwise, they were, um, if it was a little more abstract, it was much more confusing and wasn't successful at all in um, communicating. And um, that's all I have for you. Thank you so much for listening and let me know if you have any questions. Abby, you're getting so much love in the chat room. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, any questions? So one question that's just come in is, what should artists and activists take away from this work? Like if you were to tell them to do something to make an impact, what is it that you would ask them to do? Um, OK, this second question looks kind of similar. Uh, yeah, so I think that um, something that I found throughout my research was that um, that this is something that I do think is a viable communication method. However, I think that um, when making this art, people should be conscious of the intended narrative that they want to be taken away. And I think that that's the difference between making art for art's sake and making art as a communication or an education tool, is that if we're really trying to use this as a communication tool, we should make sure that um, that the narrative that we're trying to get across is clear. Um, anyway. Thanks, Abby. If you want to attend to everyone else in the chat room, you'll see a few more have just come in. Okay. Up, we have Olivia Shanahan. So Olivia, whenever you're ready, your screen should be able to open up. Thank you. Great job, Abby. So I'm just gonna share my screen. Second. Hmm. hmm. Sorry, I'm having a little bit of an issue. Which seems to be the norm with Zoom. Are you seeing the little button at the bottom of the screen shares? Yeah, and it, I don't know why it's not. There we go. Yep, that looks like that's working. See it now? Okay, mm -hmm. great. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Olivia Shanahan, and I'm here to talk to you today about parents' attitudes and beliefs towards vaccines, specifically the MMR vaccine. Um, I decided to talk about, to research this topic, because we have in the past previously eradicated diseases such as the measles, polio, and smallpox. Hopefully, for most of us, you've only seen the effects of these diseases in your textbooks. You know, we know that vaccines save lives. The CDC estimates that 21 million hospitalizations and 750,000 deaths have been prevented by the vaccines just within the last 20 years, which is a, a really, um, you know, crazy numbers. And yet there's a threat of vaccine hesitancy and there, there's concern that a lot of these some of these diseases may have a resurgence. Um, in 2019, 
WHO added vaccine hesitancy to their um, to their threats to global health, their list of them, just to understand really how significant being added to this list is. The other other members of this list are air pollution and climate change and antimicrobial resistance. So this is a really significant concern that we're having. Um, because the MMR vaccine grants nearly lifetime immunity, the CDC concluded that vaccine hesitant parents must become, must be becoming more prevalent. And while research concluded that that was true, it's not exactly clear why. So I decided to create my own survey and really delve into what was concerning parents the most about vaccines. So my survey was constructed of 16 questions. Four of them were demographic questions and the other 12 of them were adapted from a tool called the Parents Attitudes Towards Childhood Vaccine Survey Tool. They were adapted to just include questions about the MMR vaccine. The only requirements for parents in my, for um, participants in my survey were that they were above age, the age of 18 and had at least one child. The, the higher scores on the PACV tool were reflective of higher hesitation towards vaccines. While 78% of respondents were women, there was no significant correlation between gender and PACV scores. Interestingly enough, there was a significant negative correlation between age and PACV scores, which you'll see illustrated on the chart to the right of the slide. Um, those that did report vaccine hesitancy most commonly cited that they were vaccine hesitant due to mistrust in the government and negative per or negative personal experience. Um, this threat of mistrust in the government is really significant right now during the time of pandemic, and I feel that it wouldn't do my project, I wouldn't do my project justice unless I was talking about COVID-19 even a little bit. Um, while there's obviously no formal research on this topic, the threat of mistrust in the government is significant on um, Twitter feeds and social media essentially saying that this device of government that we have right now is causing breaks in scientific data that we have well we scientists have proven is true so in conclusion i think it would be really interesting to create a public health campaign addressing those negative personal experiences and possibly promoting positive personal experiences while also trying to dispel some of the concerns about the government and that there's possibly hiding um, possibly hiding negative findings and things of that nature. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for listening and for being here and a very special thanks to Dr. Lytle for everything that she's done for this project and how she's helped me. Thank you. Olivia, can you tell us how exactly did you field your survey? Sorry, what was that? How did you field your survey? Like, where was it sent or by what medium did people respond? So it was um, using Qualtrics. It was sent out as a link to um, Facebook groups, Reddit, uh, Facebook groups, Twitter, and volunteer pages on Craigslist. That's awesome. I think it's neat, uh, neat finding as a standalone that like 78% of people who are willing to respond to it, which sounds like a question about their children's health for women. That's really kind of neat to just find on its own. Yeah, it was it was a very interesting, um, very interesting study, definitely, and I'm glad I picked this research topic. There's a question in the chat that comes from Dylan Moon that says, um, "Are there any pro-vax ongoing campaigns?" There's um, so from my research, there's always promotions by the CDC. They're not actively in the sense where they're television commercials or ads on YouTube, but they are like posted in doctor's offices and things of that nature that promote vaccination. Um, there's a, actually, interestingly enough, there's a lot of pro-vaccination um, advertisements on maternity, on like uh, um, OBGYN floors of hospitals and things of that nature. So I thought that was really interesting that it's kind of always in the background. 
And then when you're thinking about internationally, are there um, World Health Organizations or comparable organizations who do this work, or did you mostly focus on the U.S.? I focused on the United States mostly because the measles has been largely eradicated for a really long time. And while it's not like, and it's, since it's not eradicated across the world, um, when people travel and when people travel or people visit the United States, they could possibly be bringing in cases. And when we have low vaccination rates, children are susceptible to measles, mumps, or rubella and susceptible to that to the consequences of these diseases. I really hope you stay with us because it also seems like COVID-19, at least what I'm hearing as a parent, is that people are afraid to take their children to the doctors at all. And so we have lower vaccine rates than we would otherwise for the past two months because people are unwilling to do that. So I hope this is something that you like continue to have an interest in and follow up on. Yeah, I hope so as well because I learned a lot about it in the last year of researching. And hopefully I'll be obtaining my master's of public health. So I think it could serve me really well. Oh, that's fantastic. Great. And then we have another question in the chat that I think you can get to because it's kind of a deep one to wade into. You can probably uh, write it. Okay. And up next, our final presenter is Lila King. So Lila, whenever you are ready, you can get your screen up. Hi, everyone. Okay. Casually ignore the like seven other tabs I have open here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, sorry, I just have to move the chat here because it's in the way. Oh. Okay. So I did my project on, um, well, the title of my project is Resting in Popularity, a Historical Analysis of Posthumous Fame. Um, it's by me and I very rudely didn't put uh, my advisor on here, which was Professor Carl. So I'm sorry, Professor Carl, you like were integral to this project. Um, next slide here. Oh. Oh, sorry. Okay. So my research question was basically what characteristics and circumstances allow for an individual to be not only remembered, but continuously celebrated. And I, I was inspired by this project actually by a class I took with Professor Muka. And on the first day, she asked us to list uh, male scientists and everyone was shouting out a whole bunch of different ones. And then she asked us to list female scientists. And, you know, I was like, oh, I'm a feminist. Like, I know this. And I was like, already. And uh, I think the only ones that we came up with were like Mary Curie and like maybe Jane Goodall, which, you know, was pretty horrifying. But since then, I've always thought about that. And I have really wondered, what is it when there are so many other people like, why do we hold on to uh, certain people and continue to perpetuate their fame when there's other people that come after them? What makes these certain individuals special? I don't know why it's not letting me switch. Okay, so for my approach and method, I did a historical analysis using a case study approach. So there's male, uh, a male and a female across two disciplines, science and art. So here we have Frida Kahlo, Vincent van Gogh, Rosalind Franklin, and Michael Faraday. And some of the factors that I specifically looked into while I was researching was the level of wealth of the individual, uh, their gender. Gender was actually a really huge underlying theme. The men <laughs> on my project are almost the control group. I was really focusing on the implications of gender and how they focus into popularity. There's also, of course, the time period that the people were in, uh, people's public perception of them, and of course, the profession and the field that they were in, the difference between accessibility, between science fields and art fields, usually art fields, the public feels that they can almost connect with it a little bit more, which is science is often daunting to more people. And so here were just two significant quotes. Um, that I found while I was researching. Um, so I mentioned already how gender was a huge underlying theme in my project. And there really is a serious problem in the writing of women's history. Um, a lot of times personality was almost assigned to the women who were being written about. And now years after they're dead, you know, we really have no choice but to kind of accept the past uh, analysis. And a lot of times it's not often accurate. Uh, especially given like Rosalind Franklin, who came much before the women's feminist movement and um, Frida Kahlo, who came almost right before. And another interesting thing here for the artist as well. So posthumous praise for his creations roused attention, but surely has been the complimentary interest in extraordinary aspects of the person, especially his underlying illness that has made Vincent van Gogh a household name. So here it was talking a little bit more about, again, when you feel like you know, a, 
Sorry. All right. <laughs> that wasn't something I was supposed to mention. Okay. So got to go back here. Oh no. Slides in the way. Okay. So um, just in the interest of time, I know I kind of sped through here, but uh, some of the conclusions were just like I mentioned before, the culture of the arts and science communities, something that I really found as far as the idolization of people was when you feel like you can assimilate yourself with them. Uh, also integration into pop culture, Frida Kahlo is all over t-shirts and can even be found on socks. <laughs> Rosalind Franklin pretty much became the poster child for um, women being slighted, which was also, so she was really adopted by uh, feminism as well. And there's also the difference between the science and arts fields as far as discoveries and concepts that stem from originals. So if someone's work was then built off of, that also played a big role. And something that also had to do with popularity was the mystery surrounding a person's life. It would intrigue people, was what I found in my research. So sorry for that one slip up there, but here we are on the last slide, if there's any questions. <laughs> Lila, this is really interesting to me. Um, I'll read you questions as they come in, but from, from my own unawareness of this, are there other sorts of people's names who, after you thought about it a little bit more, you're like, oh, that counts, that counts too, that you didn't have when you initially had that question of like, who, do, who comes to mind first? Uh, yeah, the people that I chose specifically, there are a lot of people I could have gone with with this project, but um, Mostly, I didn't mention this earlier, but obviously race is a huge <laughs> uh, factor into why someone is remembered, particularly because racism is something that very much still persists today. So I really specifically chose the people that I had because I was trying to focus on gender and didn't feel like I could do um, justice to both race and gender as well. Uh, Frida Kahlo is a little bit of an exception there, but something that I wanted to focus on as well is how her perception has been changed and she's also actually whitewashed a lot by people, which I think has helped uh, persist her popularity as well. So there were other people that I was considering using, but this ended up being the core group. And Michael Faraday, um, for those who don't know, is really well known for his work in um, electromagnetism. And so there's Faraday's law and things named after him. And so he was almost like my baseline control <laughs> of a, a straight white man who like had a perfectly successful career to compare other people to him and see how it differed versus how his path to popularity and his persistence worked against other people's. Okay, and then um, Lainey, Pfefferman has a question that's coming that says, are estates generally okay with kind of this post-life fame? So um, within, I'm gonna interpret this the best way I can, but with, as far as Vincent Van Gogh, for example, so his sister-in-law was actually the one who really played an enormous role in his fame by releasing um, after his death and the death of his brother, her husband, the correspondences between the two of them. And so it was her donation to the public and she eventually became the head of the, you know, uh, Van Gogh estate that created, um, you know, all the hype about him now. Uh, those letters are still hanging up in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, which tracks like, millions upon millions of visitors from around the world a year. So I'd say um, in situations like his, uh, I don't think that there's really any complaint there, seeing as they were the ones that inspired it to begin with, but um, a huge thing with Frida Kahlo, because she, when this happens with a lot with women remembered posthumously, is, and same with Rosalind Franklin, is there's a lot of liberty taken as to what their reactions, um, as to what their personality was like and how they would have reacted to certain things there's basically personalities assigned to the women. And so a lot of times they're not as pleased. <laughs> and I was actually able to find a lot more articles about that. Okay, and then we have a final question from Tom Blackson, which says, do you think the practice of celebrating women whose achievements have been overlooked in the past will also lead to women's achievements being appreciated in the present? Thanks for giving me a hard question, Tom. Okay, so, um, I would have to say that uh, while I was researching, one of the things that I came across was uh, in a book about um, like the women's art movement, well, the women's feminist movement and how it uh, corresponded with art. 
was a, a big concern of a lot of people is that if you focus too much on the past about like, oh, giving these women their rights due, um, their due rights, you're almost overlooking the women in the present. So I'd say it's a little bit of a balance in that you can go back, uh, recognize women, recognize their achievements, but also if you glorify too much, <laughs> the things that happened in the past are also missing what's happening right in front of you. So I guess it would just be not overemphasizing the people who came before. Okay, and you have a few more questions in the chat, but we have to wrap up. And um, I wanna thank you all for agreeing to do this. I know this has been like a wild ride to the end of the year. Um, I'm so proud of the work that all the seniors have done, and I'm really happy to work with such great colleagues to kind of get you to this finish line to help everyone get to this final Zoom meeting where we can all celebrate what you're doing. Right now we have a few minutes of transition and what we're going to be up to next is Chris Manzione is gonna walk you through the visual arts and tech program. And I can tell you, having watched um, their kind of expo last night, it's really awesome. And I hope that you guys all stick around to let him talk to you about what they're doing in that program and maybe walk you through the website so you can see all the work that those seniors are doing as well. Thank you all for joining us for the virtual conference.